Okay, thanks very much for joining me on the on the channel today, Mum. Um, so I know this this episode's a little bit different, but um, so Mum, can you can you tell me a little bit about like give me a little introduction to your to your life's work and what you've been doing over the last thirty years? Well, I studied Italian right through school and uni, did honors Italian, and then I've been teaching it uh, for over forty years. Um, it's always a learning experience. You learn more and more as you go. Um, you uh, get more in depth, and you get pleasure, and you get it's a passion. It has to be a passion as you watch the students and help them reach the VCE level and uh, get the best results you can um, and work them hard. Uh, but yeah, it all pays off. It's it's, it's good. It's rewarding. Yeah, it's very interesting that you use that word. It has to be a passion. You mm-hmm. know. Um, mm-hmm. So I guess as what you say, you know, it's a real vocation and I think um, you and I can both attest to that. You really learn languages for mm. the uh, satisfaction of just, just learning something new every day, learning a new word and mm. getting getting involved in that in that world. Watching Italian news every morning makes me grow. <laughs> I'm still learning new words after 40 years. I married an Italian. Um, so I think, yeah, learning it at school and then... Speaking it with a family is two different issues completely. Uh, you have to marry the two. They have two different skills. Yeah. So if you're academically involved, inclined, which I was for Latin too, it starts the passion. But that's not the end of the story. It's a long road to learn, learn to talk and um, interact on a daily mm. level with communicative skills. Yeah. That's it. It's not just something you you gain overnight, right? It's a. Mm. It's a. You have to practice excellence mm. in in this mm. language. You have mm. to. Mm. Um, it's like being in a state of practice, basically, mm, you know. Always and learning, yeah. You, you can never really beat yourself up that you may not mm. know a certain word or you're mm, not speaking mm, fluently. Mm. You've just got to enjoy getting in the mm. nth percent better every day. The other thing you should do is read widely, um, yeah, just to keep your knowledge maintenance level. If you want to improve, of course, everyone does. You should keep reading, keep listening to the is news. Is that, um, say, for people learning Italian, is that, um, you mean just Italian no, text? My, myself. Or, yeah, yeah. Oh, myself. Yeah, you can read comics, you can read newspapers, you can read anything. But yeah, expose yourself. On the subject of it, of Italy. Oh, yeah, in Italian. Yeah. No, in Italian. Okay, yeah. Read, yeah, yeah. expose yourself. Uh, exactly, exactly. Much, Visit the country. Yeah, yeah. Do in-country courses. Uh, oh, good one. Look, everything got to help. You can't just sit on it. I have adult students who've been coming to me for years, singly, on their own, who want maintenance level because if they know they didn't, they would lose it. A language is something that which you will lose if you don't practice. Yeah, so mm. maintenance and improvement. That's what it's all about, yeah. Once you got your VCE. <laughs> Brilliant. And um, my mum touched on this early on in the in the sentence, but for those of you that don't know what Italian news, it's, it's basically Italian news uh, broadcast at, is it 8 a.m. every morning on? 7.30 on the TV, there SBS, you but you can listen to the radio. Yeah. 93.1 FM. They have different languages. Italian's 8 to 10 every morning, but they have different languages throughout the day. Yeah, yeah. So for those uh, more time poor or technologically um, progressed, yeah, of course you can look it up on mm. on the internet and mm. um, listen to like a podcast style fashion, mm. right? Mm. But I remember when you were young, year twelve, you did five minutes and you said "basta," that's enough. So look, any exposure, you don't have to sit there for the whole hour. You can say, "I've listened yeah. to I've my little bit of practice per day," and I tell my students mm. that five minutes per day is better than anything. You know, better than nothing. Yes. It can be um, very intense, mm, mm. Um, and you're right. Maybe five minutes of, of proper hard concentration mm, mm, is good mm, than just mm, watching mm, thirty mm, minutes mm, and mm. having it all go over your head. Yeah, because and tuning um, out. Yeah, exactly. And I, I remember I did the same with Spanish news uh, when when I was learning mm. Spanish, and um, you tuned out. Yeah, I, I found that it was a good thing. To, like while you you know eating your breakfast or something, something passive, and it you know you get sort of um, updated politically about mm. what's happening economically about what's happening in that country yeah mm. okay so where do you think um your love italian your love for italian grew and and what do you think what kind of conditions helped to foster that mm. well, i was a very academic background as i said i did latin at the same time so that inspired me as a young student i was probably We're talking 12. in high school yeah right? i was probably yeah. 12 picking up first Italian, then Latin, and seeing the parallelism between the two and being a very academic student helped. I think to do Italian at school, you have to be fairly academic. I liken it to learning maths. The the rules are pretty analytical. Some people liken it to learning music. 
But there's two different sides of the brain. You can be the analytic side and love the grammar, which I do. Or you can be the creative side and love the musicality of it. I think you need to marry the two at the end of the day. But doing well at school throughout my life, um, being an A student, then going to uni, I fell down a, a bit. But um, yeah, just um, the positive reinforcement when you do something at school and do well and it becomes your favourite mm. subject. 100%. That is definitely um, a very encouraging thing um when you're when you're good at something you're right that that makes you want to continue it right so there's there's definitely a certain level of aptitude that Mm. Mm. um helps to growing progress in a language not to say if you find a language totally difficult that you can't progress Mm. with it and what do you think has dedicated like what has made you dedicate um your life to italian over 30 years like that's a Mm. long time to i guess you know just stick to one language and be so passionate and and Um, and enamored with it you know what enamored yeah i found it uh was an easy subject to teach oh the beauty for me was starting off teaching uh italo australian girls 34 years ago in northcote that was absolutely cultural (laughs) culturally relevant and um and the funny thing was i could speak to their parents and uh i could um I could tell their parents exactly where they were at, whereas the other teachers couldn't, and they'd be translating for their teachers, say maths teachers, and telling them, I'm all right, when they weren't all right. So I could see right through them and speak the language of the parents. And the parents were so enwrapped wrapped that I could speak their language, albeit they spoke dialect and I spoke Italian, but there was a great communication going on. I probably learned a lot um, those first years, early years from um, becoming an academic student to becoming a, a, a teacher who could then speak with the parents and, and get the different level going, apart from marrying an Italian too. Um, so mm-hmm. it all came together. Um, and then another passion for mine was um, bringing up two children and making them be bilingual from the word go. I made them speak Italian to their grandpa and their nonni from the word go, and that was also fun because they spoke more Italian than English when they were children, and my mother couldn't understand them. She was most uh, a bit cut about that. And I have a good story about my daughter, who's now 32, dragging her grandmother to the fridge and saying, succo, succo, succo. Just to clarify, this is her um, parents. English, Anglo-Saxon yeah. grandmother with zero sort of yeah. Mediterranean uh, of uh, experience. Grandma didn't know what succo meant and the one-year-old couldn't speak English. So she drags grandma out of the fridge and points to the succo, which means juice. That grandma got the succo out finally. So this child realised <laughs> from day one that you can't speak that language to that grandma, but you have to speak the other language to the other grandma. So... I did child language acquisition in my master's, applied linguistics master's, and did a study of this. It was really interesting that children have um, segments of their brain devoted to each language, and uh, that's very malleable when they're young. But by the age 14, you will notice this, that kids keep lose the accent up before 14. But after 14, if you migrate to a different country, you will never lose the accent. So there's some hard wiring of the brain going on during ad- early adolescence which means you'll learn the language but not as well as if you're a child. Equally, a child will forget the language if they move countries. Um, I remember one child went back to Italy, and when I caught up with her, she was eight. Three years later, she'd say, um, I to the shop, go. <laughs> her English had gone down the drain because she was young. But older people will re- retain the first language, uh, but they won't pick up the second language. Another interesting fact is old, old people in their 90s, maybe starting to get dementia, will go back to what we call L1. They will... Um, in the old people's homes, prefer their original language because they start to forget the language they learned. Um, so any learning in the brain sort of later in life is always secondary to primary, initial learning. Right. So is the L1 is like a depth of learning yeah, in the brain, right? Yeah, it's embedded. Right? You're embedded. Yeah, it's yeah. instinctive. It's amazingly different to any other language you learn later on. Um, mm. L1 is just part of you. But I loved that, bringing up the children bilingually. Um, it was amazing. But by the time she got to school, age five, she'd say, Mum, in Italian, she'd say, Mum, I don't speak that language in front of my friends. So she became conscious that there was, enough. she'd already conscious with her two grandmothers, but it was embarrassing to speak a different language from her friends. So that's sort of yes. social linguistics, but um, that's getting off the point. But there's some, be some interesting moments in my life regarding um, the teaching of Italian, bringing it into the family and making my little experiment. Yeah. No, that's very, you, very uh, in-depth. You're a victim. <laughs> <laughs> a very um, willing, willing victim, we'll you say it that. Started your passion for languages. Now you know about six languages, I know. No, not oh, yeah. not to the level yeah. I know Italian, yeah. but you know, yeah, yeah, I have dabbled, right? Mm. Um, you had a good start. They I say, guess yeah. I guess I would consider learning languages as a whole, kind of like not that I play an instrument myself mm. musically, but I've I've heard that 
people who learn an instrument to a good to a good standard to a good degree can then pick up other instruments quite well mm, and quite mm, quickly. Mm. And I believe the same is quite language, similar yes. with, with languages. Yeah. It's kind of it's a way of yeah. thinking, isn't it? It's a way of embedded yeah. unlocking your brain. I was going to say that if you are bilingual from the start, you will then pick up language two and three and four much more easily, and that's probably what you've found. Yeah, because you've got the brain that's open to different ways of saying things. Yeah. And a child is more intelligent because they know you say tabula and you can say table and that each item has got different names. It necessarily um, mm. has one name and that's supposed to be a sign of a help to your um, yeah. your brain expanding or something, some theory about that. Yeah. I've definitely heard that this can this um, phenomenon can mm. also happen with um, dialects as well, which oh, is yeah. why in a lot of European mm. nations mm. they are local councils are fighting to retain mm, mm. Um, formal instruction of dialects yeah, like Aboriginal at languages schools. Too. Yeah, yeah, because mm. learning a dialect at um, a young age is like learning a second language mm, mm, and mm. then it keeps the Different kids um, more open-minded, I mm. guess. and it Respects their culture. Yeah, their brain's more, more malleable, mm. correct. And otherwise they will die out because... Mm, that's right. um, a generation will lose it. If they're not used in schools, you know, it's, it's the other just thing, a Did you know that language comes through the mother? Because the mother spends traditionally more time with the child, so if you intermarry, you'll say mm. you a good marriage where Italian mm. and English, and the husband doesn't speak the mother's language, and vice versa. If the kid spends all day or more time with the mother, it will learn say the mother's language is Italian. So that's generally what happens. However, when you're in the environment, the English will come in anyway. But, um, yeah, so I would say to every mixed marriage, go with that language, push it to the kid even if the husband doesn't understand or the other partner doesn't understand. Because you see, very often, kids grow up and say, oh, my dad speaks French, but I don't. It's such a waste. Mm. You should do it from birth. and The mother's about language is always more dominant. It is, mean, but yeah. it doesn't matter which... There's two arguments there. The mother's is dominant, but um, if there's two different languages in the home and they don't understand them, the other partner, it doesn't matter. Push it at the expense of the father or mother being left out because eventually the kid will pick up English anyway. But it's going to have a head start if it knows that that other language which you'll never get later in life yeah precisely it's a bit a bit of a general question on on um italian what do you think has been the hardest concept uh whether it be grammatical idea um or lesson that kids have had to learn you know kids, in yeah. across you know we're talking like year seven to twelve like what's mm. the thing they struggle the most with when they're young, they tend to drop it because the grammar's getting hard. I think, look at German, I think that's 10 times harder, anyway. And the kids drop that too, but then there's the false illusion you get better score up in year 12, so they, they don't drop German. But yeah. The numbers, I must say, like lower, but I don't know. I think they keep German because of the score up. Yeah. I think they find the grammar daunting. For example, in any language, if you see in Italian, there's seven ways of saying the, and please don't let me put any potential students off. <laughs> It's ridiculous, seven ways to say that. But if you can get your head around that rule and a few basic rules, you're set for life in Italian. You just yeah. have to be on top of the rules as you go and um, and enjoy putting bits and pieces together in an analytical way. Yeah. The older students, VCE, struggle with the listening, and I was the same when I was a, their age. Um, the listening is a, a separate skill. Correct. The talking, you can train them to say the topics that they're trained for. That's yeah. okay. But listening, and I, when I did French, I found this daunting too. I did the French exam as a, as a mature age student. Um, the listening is daunting because you cannot control what they're going to throw at you. You can practice, practice, mm. but at the end of the day, it's a bit of an open field and um, listening's, I must say in French, much harder. But my students do struggle with listening. They say we never get enough practice, which is time constraints yeah. and reality. You can probably never um, do enough listening. So, yeah, that's that's the biggest hurdle, I'd say. Yeah. I would say, um, yeah, you're right. Like, say, in a test environment, it's so psychological, mm, isn't it? Because scary. you could be listening to something, mm, mm, you get thrown mm, by not knowing mm, what one, one word, word means, yeah. and you think it's important. Yeah, your brain yeah, is staying yeah, on that yeah, one word, yeah. forgetting what is continuing to be said. That's right. And then you're, you're, you're thrown, mm. and then you start freaking out, that's and then right. you start in taking nothing, right? And mm, but that's a test environment. Like, I'll give you my exam pra- pra- experience in the French. It said, grass. Ah, and I heard grass, G R A W S E, fat. Okay. Twice I heard the same thing, fat. When I, later on, people told me grass, ah, which I should know, is grazia, ah, which means thanks too. Same yeah. sound, homonyms, oh, they are bane of your life. English mm. has a lot of them, Italian not so much, but yeah, I didn't think beyond grass meaning fat. I didn't think of grass meaning gr- thank you, you know, grass, ah. Yeah. Thanks yeah. too. Oh, yeah, Spot so on. I think um, obviously when you 
even if you like are traveling to a new country and you want to live there or you just want to be conversational with the locals mm. like um yeah listening and speaking is real daunting but mm, mm, um mm, especially in French. listening definitely gets better with practice with practice and also when when you're like you know you, you always as humans i think we always find ourselves in regular situations for example you go to order your coffee mm. the things that the conversation you're going to have with the barista is 99% uh, of the time going to be the pretty same. much the same, mm, right? Mm, so you're mm. going to have that repetition yeah, of certain words yeah, yeah. coming at you yeah. and you're going to be able to, you're going to be able to pick them up in that context mm. easier yeah, and easier. You know? yeah. Another interesting student I, I tutored, she did really well in French, Italian, Latin. She said, you know why I love Latin the most? Because I don't have to do an oral. <laughs> here she was, very, yeah. very good at speaking <laughs> every skill in Italian and French, yeah. I presume too. But here she was, scared of the, the oral, and um, that was why she loved Latin she so much. She could prepare, prepare, prepare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. What do you think, I guess, touching on this hard stuff like listening, and, uh, yeah, probably we'll, we'll stick with this example of, of listening. Mm. What's, what's some of the most effective uh, strategies that kids could use mm. to help their listening? I know we touched on mm. uh, watching the news mm. and... Um, mm. Well, just general listening I'll tell you what I did. Comprehension. Year 11, and shock horror, we had to start listening to things because it was quite a foreign concept then mm. for academics, you know, in those days, was read a passage in my own voice, tape myself, and play it back. And since I'd just read it, I sort of had an idea what it was about. I said, oh, I can understand that now because I'm hearing it back. So I thought that was a really good thing to do. And I tell my students to do the same. I don't know if they do, but... Do you agree it's a good idea? That's really good. I've never mm. honestly used that before. Because mm. mm. um, you know what it's about. And you just yeah. have to hear it. I've, um, I've experimented with, and I've, I've, I think the listeners know this one, but um, watching a movie in mm -hmm. with mm. the subtitles mm. of that language That's on. That's right, exactly Because right. you can yeah. read and mm. hear the words That's right, at but the not same in English. Time. In English, yeah. it's a no-brainer. You learn nothing. Yeah, yeah. And I've been guilty of going back. I go to the Italian Film Festival, they put the subtitles on, and of course I straight away read them because that's your mm. dominant language. So, yes, my students need those subtitles, but they need them in Italian, otherwise they wouldn't understand anything. Yeah, correct. There's, there's definitely only so far you can get mm. um, reading the context. subtitles, correct. And also yeah. the context of the movie, don't give them everything. Um, they need a bit of help, a bit of a crutch, which is in their language, that's okay, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. but better than nothing. How do you think? How important do you think it is to be well balanced in your understanding of the language in terms of having reading skills, writing skills, listening, and speaking? Mm. You know the four pillars yeah. of a language. Yeah, okay, um, see what you're using it for. Right. If you're using it for a VCE exam. You have to have everything up, up to par, like everything good. Yeah, yeah. If you're daily in contexts, I suppose grammar comes last because you yourself have said you can communicate. Without the best of grammar, you can say, I, to the shops, go. <laughs> mm. And where's gone mummy, I heard one kid say one day. So well, we know what that means. Yeah, yeah, speakers. yeah. So yeah, they've yeah. always said the grammar is not important when you're communicating. So, but for VCE students, a different ballgame, you have to be able to write. But in real life, do we write? No, we don't. So yes. um, it's two different ballgames. There's the, the academic exams, which I teach for, and the reality skills, which probably you know more about. So, yeah, they're all important. Yeah, anyway. I would argue that... Um, if you want to like live in a new country and um, or you just want to go on holidays there, mm. obviously speaking and mm. listening are the only really important mm. skills. Just Reading is important because you need to read, read menus. Street signs, minimal. Well, instructions on yeah. certain... Yeah, um, but not um, huge know, amounts. Tourist waivers. And writing, definitely not important in this day and age. So I much. would argue that... If you are looking to work, you need writing mm. skills. Oh, definitely. You need to be able to send emails saying I'd like game. to apply for yeah, this yeah, job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what if you're working in a corporate environment where you send emails back mm. and forth mm. to each other? Mm. Mm. Your skills are going to be very um, But I do, I do think ri ri uh, writing is a very academic exercise. Mm. Like Almost archaic. It's not used Yeah, much like we've, in Germany, we've practiced um, writing let letters to mm. the editor. Mm. Like mm. I've mm. never even done that mm. in English. Exactly, yeah. You know? like, My kids don't even know how to write a letter. Yeah, How unrealistic yeah, is that? Yeah, you're right. You're you know, right. address the date at the top. Oh, what's the letter? So many text types are yeah. just And you, with postcards, you um, emailed me once and said, How do I write a postcard? Where do I put the address? Yeah. So that's um, the modern kids yeah, don't, exactly, don't yeah. get exposed and they don't that's, need it. Um, mm. That's reality. Yeah. Okay. Um, I know you touched on this one before, but um, 
What what is some, what about your learning experience with other languages? So I know you said you did French mm, and Latin, which mm. is in, incredibly impressive at, at high school. I didn't um, do French ha- at school. No, no, but yeah, Latin, in your yeah, adult yeah, life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With um, Latin and French, how, do you think mm. they really helped your understanding of Italian? And do you think maybe because you learned French afterwards, mm. do you think Italian helped you with your mm. French? And they say French and Italian are like tennis and squash. They interfere with each other, which is very true. The grammar rules are parallel, 99%, except the prepositions can vary after verbs. Oh, what like, do you mean by the grammar patterns are parallel? Uh, when to use subjunctive, when to use art, when to use di. The thing that annoyed me sometimes the gender was different, like il mare, la mer. Yeah. See, could be changed gender. That's oh, annoying. Nice one, yeah. Not the end of the deal, not at the end of, not a big deal, but um, it's annoying for me who's a perfectionist. Um, <laughs> French came in later in my life when I was a uni student. Um, yes, I could uh, read it okay. Understanding is difficult because it's a hard language uh, to, to understand. Speaking, again, uh, you could learn what you had to say. When I went to France, I found where well, you know what you want to say. You could do the basics. Um, so, yes, it was a help having Italian and Latin behind me. Um, but at times it was a, a bit of a confusion because it was so similar. Is this word called a distractor, uh, and tennis and squash players know that because they're similar, but they're a tad different, so they're not mm. to distract each other. So, yes and no. I think Spanish should be the same. Um, it's good to get on board, but um, beware there'll be um, pitfalls along the way. But well, they a big deal. I don't know. Mm. Yes, interesting. Mm. And I never took the French accent very well because I was older. I was twenty. Having said that, if I was eleven when I started Italian, I don't know if I would have got the French accent better as a child. Maybe, maybe. So I say children, even 11-year-olds, pick up things better than 20-year-olds. So that's probably a regret. I chose Italian over French at that age. Um, well, my father did for me. Mm. Uh, who's to know? Anyway, I always wanted to do French. Um, but the accent is harder to pick up when you're older. I definitely know that. Uh, yes. But I already had the, the basic skills, so nothing else was so bad for me. It's just the accent, yeah. Yes. And and when I'm, I guess, touching on grammatically similar, mm, like... Mm, that was easy. They have the, you know past present mm, they have mm, present they right. have a future a and they're formed with past. similar rules yeah i definitely found after knowing all those tenses in italian it was like yeah going from tennis to squash you know pretty mm. much the same just to hold your racket a different way right? a cousin yeah going to a cousin. exactly yeah. and you start the mm. same patterns you can recognize in italian start to appear mm. in french it's and the spanish is the same as well and yeah um, and the vocab's very similar too Yes, yes, that's it. Latin based, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, like, boy, Latin would have been hard, no? Or uh, Very grammatical. Lots of conjugations, lots of declensions. Yes, but I think when you're a kid and you have no distractions, you just, um, just st- study, um, study away and, and do it. Like, I think now if I was to do Latin, I probably wouldn't have the patience. You yeah. need, in a kid, if a kid is academic, he or she will put in. Because there's, having, well, these days there might have distractions, but in our day we didn't have distractions. Um, just did our work and got on with it. Um, and if you liked something, you, you did it. And it was more like, I always did maths and languages first and left the um, the hard ones, for me English was hard, <laughs> well, hard to think. Yeah. So last. Um, so if you have the passion and you love doing, for me it was mechanical sort of stuff, like you know, bits, putting bits together. Without deep, yeah. It's not deep thinking, it's just, um, yeah. Analytic. Building blocks. Yeah, that. I'd do them first. Latin translating became very hard as I got at uni. Whoa, that was heavy going. But um, at school, it was all doable. It's okay. Yeah. Oh, it annoyed me you had to do Latin poetry. But I'm not a poetic sort. <laughs> yeah. I didn't appreciate the nuances, but I love the language side of things. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. It, I guess it would be hard if you don't appreciate an art form mm. in your native language. Mm, How mm, are you mm, going to mm, do mm, it in, mm, in a foreign language, mm, you know, mm, like... Mm. Um, and also, I guess poetry is really next level because you've got mm. to understand what rhymes in that too yeah. that language it's like it's comedy as well once mm. they say once you understand mm. comedy mm. in the language mm. you are mm. you're quite high level you know comedy in italian is different from english comedy you've got to realize that Every it's cultural culture, as well culture isn't has it? its own yes, yeah. style of comedy and they laugh at different things from what you'll laugh at correct what are they correct. laughing at if you've yes. ever got the joke i used to go to see italian plays early on and think what are they laughing at yeah. So that's quite threatening uh, to understand the comedy. Yeah, it's another another um, ball game altogether. Yeah, yeah. Mm, it's yeah. You're right there. Mm. On the jokes, yeah, the jokes. Remember, um, my father and I would laugh at some silly jokes. I don't think they were silly, but that was their their cultural sensitivity. Yeah. <laughs> you're talking about non-non. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, how has Italian helped you when you travel? And what are your, your favourite places there and why? <laughs> why ask? I've been to Italy 10 times. <laughs> why? What a silly question. Um, <laughs> love going there. But that's also because my husband's relatives always make a fuss and look after us when we're in the north. Just to clarify, um, so my mum was born from Anglo-Saxon yeah, she parents, did. but she married my dad who... Um, has Italian parents, so hmm. that's why, like, her in-laws are Italian, but her, her actual parents are him. Anglo-Saxon. That's why I married him. <laughs> why? Because he was Italian? Yeah. <laughs> oh. um, yeah, so it's good. I have friends in all over Italy, um, in various spots, not all over, one in Puglia. And I used to have one in Sicily who, unfortunately, now lives in Melbourne, so it's no use. <laughs> oh. um, but, yeah, the relatives in the north, so... Uh, I guess most of the time I go there, I'm looked after. However, I've been on some great um, teacher trips in, mm. in groups of teachers. We went to Rome and stayed three weeks, did a course, which was good for teachers, and did a lot of um, cultural stuff, events. Uh, I did one in Florence for teachers group and one in Perugia. And similarly, I've done a couple of school group trips when we've been all around, Rome, Florence, Venice, the usual places, and taken the girls around. Um, so that's probably five rather structured um, teaching-based courses. And when probably, she means the girls, she means her students, yeah, like yeah. she teaches in an all girls school, yeah. And five other little random, like, admittedly, the last trip was only a weekend because I was in London and I skipped over for a weekend in northern Italy to see the relatives. So, yes, I've been 10 times and loved it all the time. Um, and you plan to go back even more times, yes, right? Yes, when coronavirus finishes, yes, definitely. So, what <laughs> that was would the question? Be nice. Which country do I like visiting? No, I know what we favourite places, but I think you touched on oh, that, you know. Anywhere um, in Italy is good, as long as it's pretty. I wouldn't want to go... I love art galleries. I love history of art. Mm. And I love museums. So don't give me a dumpy place. And there's dumpy places anywhere you go, I suppose. But I like to go to the, the scenic places. I like their landscapes, their view, you know, their, their tourist. Culturally, tourists. artistically yeah. rich places. Yeah, yes. patrimonial heritage. Um, We're talking with galleries that are like 500 mm. years old. and But also yeah. the beautiful landscapes take, uh, which a lot of the coastline on the um, Mediterranean side is, is quite fantastic, especially Malfi Coast and Cinque Terre. Mm. Um, I, I, I'm a bit of a pain. I, I correct my dentist when he says Cinque Terre. I say, no, it's Cinque Terre. <laughs> Your dentist. Because he oh. says I'm going to the Cinque Terre anyway. I, I have to correct people. I'm not paying. Of course, that's a terrible faux pas. You know, you just yeah, let it go. You, you hear it and you can't. Yeah, I wince. You can't not correct them. That's the other it. side of Italy is not so dramatic. Um, it's flat, like Ravenna and, and those towns on the coast. There, I, I haven't spent much time there, so I do pick and choose and go to the, um, the better, mm. the more scenic spots because I think they're, they're, they're great. Correct. Mm. Now I know every time you've been to Italy, your Italian's been quite competent. You've been speaking mm. to people. Could you imagine? how it would be if you did not speak that mm. much Italian, you know? I, and I guess what I'm mm. trying to illustrate is how much do you think knowing that language enriches your experience? Mm. Makes you enjoy it. There. It gives you power. I've always said language gives you power, empowerment because you can get ripped off and you cannot argue back. Like, for example, once I was in Rome at the station, they gave me a large piece of pizza. I said, no, I ordered a small piece, so I'm not going to pay for this piece. I was able to argue with her and say, no, I'm not paying for this. So she then had to cut me a small piece. If I'd been illiterate in the language, I would have just accepted it and shut up and gone my own sweet way. Yeah. I think I had that sense of power and boldness and able to argue my way. And same with the taxi driver. If he was to rip me off, I could argue. So I'd be very scared if I went to Japan, for example, and didn't know a word of the language. I'd feel um, vulnerable. Probably. Yes. That's yeah. a great point you touch mm -hmm. on. And even though this may have been true like 30 years ago, it's mm -hmm. still very, very true and important for mm. people to... Survival um, skills people to have today yeah i have taught adults and they think they can do six weeks travel courses i don't think you can you can try and give them lots and lots of scenarios but the in-depth they haven't got and they will have so can you argue in the language no you can get around you can say where is the station yeah. um please can i pay with cash or uh, credit card yes you can learn step, set phrases but for that in-depth sense of power no nah, you need to be able to be quite fluent yeah. mm. um okay a bit of a Bit of a side dodge back to your education days. Now, I know you did some linguistic studies. Mm, I did. Now, how how was that, and how did it tie into your Italian? And mm, unfortunately, what can, you say about, what can you say about that? Uh, I did linguistics one, and moving towards a masters in applied linguistics when I was an adult. Um, I probably would have preferred to do a masters in Italian, but being a teacher, I thought, well. 
I know enough Italian, maybe I should head the others. They say applied linguistics is more practical. Like a general skill rather than how to uh, teach a language. honing in on Italian. Yeah. Yes, like a meta skill, you know, yeah. how, learning Something. how to learn. Yeah. Yes, yeah. However, applied linguistics is very theoretical and mm. I didn't find it that much use. But I did enjoy linguistics one, linguistics two, the basics. Um, it just, again, showed you how many languages have things in common, how man or woman or person has built up um, knowledge of language through similar concepts across countries, across cultures. Mm. And sometimes they're different. One language might have a word for Earring, one might have a language for your earrings. Depends on the culture, if they wear one earring or two. So little things like that. It Correct. opens your brain. Social linguistics is good too. It shows you how and, um, hybrid languages develop and pidgin languages develop. And you've yourself alluded to that. Um, if you say French and English in Canada, probably have developed a blend. Yes, Italo-Australian yeah. has blended uh, the Italo-Australian, the oldies used to speak because it's dying out now. It's a mishmash of Yeah, you know, it's a natural Italian phenomenon. English, you yeah. put two languages together, things will, and they can't go back to Italy and communicate because their Italian has become so pigeonized that um, yeah. they often they can't use it, like Steve, for our friend. The Italians can't understand the language that's grown up here, so they have to go back. And now does, um, forgive me, does pigeonized sort of mean like bastardized yeah, or... Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, mixed in mm, with another mm, language. So they'll yeah, say, yeah. vado alla shoppa. I'm going to the shop. And of course, I know what shop I mean. Of course, the shop is. Yeah, they put the on the yeah, yeah. yeah. Sometimes it works, like El Parco, the park, perfect, fine, but they can't do it to every word. And book becomes buco. Bus becomes basso. Doesn't work. <laughs> but they think it will work. But anyway, that's interesting, yeah. Just weirdly, mm. book to buco. Yeah. Me, a book is whole, whole in Italian, so you'd be you'd be saying you'd be stuck. a whole. I'm reading a whole. Really, yeah. you mean a book? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And they use half English, half Italian. Thing to be and even I have to stop myself when I'm on the phone, really saying it was like oh, very. Oh, you know, even non will say sono sto very 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 good. You, throw, <laughs> you will throw in, and once you're in Italy, though, the environment. Yeah. I've learnt this too. The environment catches you and controls you a bit better because you're surrounded by the language. But when you're in Australia, you tend to go with the majority, which is speaking a little bit hybrid. Cause you just fall into it. But when you're yeah. in Italy, you up, up, pick up your aunt, your level and you just go for it because you're surrounded by it. So that's... Um, of course. There's a stimulus yeah. that surrounds yeah. you. Yeah, the environment's yeah. very important. Yeah. Yes, precisely. For those interested in, in picking up Italian from mm. scratch, could you re- recommend them any good, like... Mm schools mm. or courses they could do like adult courses yeah. and institutions yeah. i have yeah. taught at a couple of adult schools cis in carlton and cae in the city um a few years ago they're all good uh just make sure you go, ask for a small class uh, mm. as beginners i have taught large classes of beginners 20 it's probably too big but then again beginners don't want or can't cope with that much oral interaction they they don't mind doing chorus interaction um, after they can't level, take advantage of it, yeah, right? Yeah. After level one, I think it's important you get to groups of under 10 because they starting to need that um, conversational interaction. Mm. Um, you can pair them up. That works well. Uh, but having said that, groups tend to, what's the word? They fall off uh, attrition rate, yeah. So you find that beyond level two, most language courses, it can be quite small. Um, and that's not good economically, but good for the, the students because the, the ones that are left are dedicated and they get that um, intense tuition. Yeah. The same price, so yes, the lower grades of classes are subsidising the higher levels, which has got to be a good thing for the high levels if they hang in there. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So you'd say CIS and CAE. CAE. There's got to be other good places, but yeah, they're they're both super play good okay. places I've taught at in the past. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. And um, all right, what do you what do you top three Italian movies that would spark an interest <laughs> in learning Italian or maybe they know some Italian and mm. they're just looking for good movie recommendations. Yes, if you're talking to teenagers uh, or Because I adults. know you've seen a lot of them. Like, <laughs> how many? Yeah. So just mm-hmm. to put in perspective, Italian Film Festival mm-hmm. in Melbourne rolls around, what, every yeah. September? Not this year because of coronavirus, but um, yeah, every September. Okay. And uh, on, on average in the two I weeks, would say how 10, many? Probably how, 10. I have you know, a friend who sees more than me, and she's one of my lady students. So Ten movies in two weeks. Yeah, that's, that's not bad. One a day, one a night. You're a cinema file, man. Anyway, I've got people who've done worse. Um, if you're talking to a teenager or an adult, uh, my favourite one for teenagers has to be Notte Prima degli Esami, Night Before the Exams. The teenagers are studying or not <laughs> for the exams and fooling around. <laughs> it's quite funny, hilarious, and they're having heaps of fun. So, okay. And they're calling the teacher a load of shit. And then he overhears them and gets offended and they find themselves in hot water, blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's just funny. Cool. Um, another classic is uh, Cinema Paradiso, which is appealing to cinema, Paradise Cinema. Yeah. 
appealing to adults and teenagers alike. Uh, another one popular... Was with... that Federico Fellini? No, no, that was done by uh, uh, Gabriele Salvatore, I think. Okay. Another popular one is La Vita e Bella with Benigni in it. Um, a bit of a silly spoof on Nazi camps, but it was sort of... Yeah. Done a bit of a, Absolute like, cra- classic. A I'll add my, my mm. personal favourite was probably... Um, Il Capitale Umano, Human Capital. Oh. I think I saw we saw oh. that about five years ago. About um, in just south of Rome in Ostia with it, um, the mafia. Evil. No, nah, that's a different one. Oh. But there, there was a good like kind of psychological drama right. intertwined life. I've seen so many. I can't remember. Um, a great TV series from from Netflix. Um, I really really dug with some um, Subura Blood oh, on that's Rome. That's the one. That's the one. I think. Was yeah, the... this is a TV adaptation. Oh, of, okay of the movie um but yeah it's about um like dirty mafia mm. politics with the mm. the catholic church in rome and, oh right um uh, yeah just go watch it it's good um and there's a lot of old classics coming coming out of italy after the war the near realist period which i've taught that, that that genre right black and whites the famous famous directors fellini visconti de sica but you've got to like appreciate that period um yeah i just throw it at people and the context yeah of what made post-war the yeah. destruction and the using of the people off the street and the, the lack of money and how they built this uh, genre up from with lack of money and they made it popular uh yeah so the italians have done well in that area uh in the filmmaking uh, even to this day and yeah and italian film festival brings out heaps of films every year so that's personal personal um choice of yeah. preference i suppose i can't yeah talk about that too much of course of course all right well um i guess we'll wrap it up here you got any further comments or anything mm. you'd like to add that we you think is important for mm, people suppose, interested in languages or italian you know in general having a really good classical education in italian and latin but italian at uni we got to maybe read the read the, the classic authors like you've probably never heard of them moravia manzoni um dante <laughs> Yeah. Some of them were, Dante was a killer, but uh, I appreciate having been through that era. I think these days they water things down. Uh, it was tough at the time, but now I have got a very broad uh, view of uh, Italian literature, which yes. kids don't get these days. So, yeah, I've been through the whole whole hog, I guess. I've, I've seen many different aspects of Italian, and it's paid off to a, a great appreciation of the whole language and culture. Hmm. Cool. Cool. Hmm. All right, well, thanks very much, Mum, and I'll let you get back to what enjoying about? your dinner, all right? No, correcting year 12 sex. Oh, oh okay. Right. Allora, in bocca al lupo. Grazie. Buon lavoro. Senz'altro. Ciao. Grazie. Ciao, ciao.